So welcome everybody to the second um, session for the Department of Medicine, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion um, summer session. As a reminder, um, we like to do the land acknowledgement. So IUPUI stands on the historic homelands of the Miami people, but also we like to recognize that it displaced a vibrant black community. Um, this series um, is also eligible for the um, uh, DEI, related training requirements by the School of Medicine. Um, so make sure that you register for the session for that credit or you send me an email to make sure that you were in attendance so we can give you that credit. I will stop sharing and introduce my esteemed colleague here, Dr. Abigail Lara. Dr. Lara comes to us from University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, where she is an associate professor of medicine. She's also the co-director of the Office of Professional Excellence at the School of Medicine and for the Anschutz Medical Campus, which serves for other schools and colleges. Dr. Lara is a practicing pulmonary and critical care physician in the Department of Medicine at the School of Medicine. She served as the Associate Program Director for the Pulmonary Critical Care uh, Fellowship Training Program for about four years and as a Program Director for two additional years. Uh, upon stepping down, she took the role of Co-Director of the Office of Professional Excellence in 2018, and she's a faculty instructor for University of Colorado School of Medicine Women's Leadership Training. She's a certified physician coach and MBTI um, certified practitioner, EQ1, EQI 2.0 certified, and recently completed a year-long training course in leading organizations to help. Under her leadership, the School of Medicine Office of Professional professional excellence, has developed processes and programs that are committed to promoting a culture in which behavior that reflects respect, integrity, compassion, and excellence in communication occurs with fluidity and organically across the continuum of the medical profession. Dr. Lara received her BA in psychology and microbiology from the University of California, San Diego, and her MD from University of Wisconsin-Madison. She completed her internal medicine residency at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, followed by a research fellowship at the Lerner Research Institute in Cleveland. She completed her preliminary and critical care medicine training at the University of Colorado and has been on faculty there since 2008. Welcome, Dr. Lara. Goodness, um, thank you very much. That was quite a mouthful, Dr. So uh, and everyone. <laughs> thank you for having me um, today to talk about professionalism and medical professionalism. So with that, I'm gonna take you over a high level overview of the work that my office has been um, participating in, leading in, and uh, certainly supporting the role of medical professionalism here on campus. So let me start with, I can get my slides going. One moment, I need a screen share first, that might help. Okay, so which um, screen am I sharing? You are sharing the actual um, slide. Perfect, okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. So um, I do not have any um, conflicts to disclose. After today's talk, um, you will I'll be able to, I hope, uh, define what is medical professionalism, understand the reporting structure that is um, available here at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and to understand the efforts that the School of Medicine have been participating in and promoting professionalism across the continuum of professional development and identity, and identity formation to enhance leadership and culture um, here on campus. The Profession as defined was first defined by the US Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandis in 1912 during his Brown University commencement um, ceremony um, speech. He defined a profession firstly as an occupation which, um, which requires training that is intellectual in nature and in character, involves knowledge and to a certain extent um, learning and is distinguished from a mere skill. Secondly, a profession is an occupation in which it, um, is pursued largely for others and not merely for oneself. 
And thirdly, it is an um, thirdly, it, profession is an occupation in which the amount of financial return is not the accepted measure of success. Here at the School of Medicine, we utilize this definition as defined by the American Board of Medical Specialties in 2012 in regard to medical professionalism. That medical professionalism is a belief system in which group members or professionals declare to each other and the public the shared competency standards and ethical values that we promise to uphold in our work and what the public and individual patients can and should expect from us. The term professionalism can be used in a variety of ways um, across different organizations, but at the School of Medicine, we felt as though this was the, um, the values and guiding principles that would most best inform the work that we do in the Office of Professional Excellence. As healthcare professionals, physicians, and advanced practice providers, our work is guided by code of ethics. The two prominent codes that most um, inform our guiding principles and the development of policies and procedures in the healthcare space include the AMA and the ACP code of, uh, code of ethics. We recognize that professionalism as a belief system is the reason why we create lists that are um, demonstrated here on this slide. And what's defined here are the characteristics that can be applied in a variety of different settings. The challenge with these lists, however, is that they're extremely reductionistic. And it suggests falsely that professionalism is primarily operationalized just at the individual level and excludes the essential group activities such as professional development formation, ongoing professional development and enforcement of standards that we need to uphold with each other. And finally, this is a list of attributes and is fundamentally different from values or guiding principles that underlie medical professionalism. So why is this important? Well, in academic medicine, um, and certainly on medical rounds, I often cite this, the literature supports X in clinical decision making. What's listed here is a screenshot of, from PubMed um, using the must terms medicine and professionalism. And what you can see is over the course of the last two decades, there has been an increased interest in defining and uh, providing interventions and curriculum um, to help support medicine and professionalism as a whole. I'm going to give you a brief history in time of the Office of Professional Excellence. Um, so back in 2011, the AAMC, LMC, um, LCME, excuse me, came um, to evaluate our curriculum. And based on recommendations for, uh, from this report, the School of Medicine developed our Faculty Professionalism Committee. Um, and this committee was tasked with uh, developing policies and procedures that would help inform the conduct that was expected of our faculty in the patient space, research space, and the educational space. In 2014, the AAMC graduation questionnaire results became public. And what was identified, unfortunately, was that our, um, our graduating students at the University of Colorado were reporting an unacceptably high number of observations and witnesses of unprofessional behavior by our faculty. As such, the Dean of the Medical School at the time, Dean Krugman, codified the Office of, Professional it, the Office of Professionalism in an effort to evaluate, remediate, and, um, evaluate and remediate reports of unprofessional behavior. In 2016, the School of Medicine deployed our first climate survey, and that was under the responsibility of Office of Professionalism. In 2018, there was a leadership transition. I came on board with my co-director that I'll, I'll introduce to you in a moment. The first task at hand was to change the name. We changed the name away from Office of Professionalism over to Office of Professional Excellence. And the intention is to um, clearly identify where our aspirational goal was in regard to culture change and to be a psychological, psychological nudge to a positive framework of professionalism as opposed to a negative framework. In 2018, the OPE, um, we redeployed our second climate survey. And we also undertook a process review of how we work through our cases that were being reported to the office and also to do a landscape scan in, in order to understand what services were needed to help promote and support a culture of professionalism. Transitioning to 2019, 2020, 
Uh, myself and Jeff, my co-director, embarked on a listening tour uh, where we really were focused on building trust, understanding what was needed on our campus within the School of Medicine, as well as the AMC campus with the other schools and colleges. And we also undertook a huge database migration in which we pulled from the literature categories and tags in regards to unprofessional behaviors so that way we could really understand what the needs were for our faculty to, to enhance our climate. And then most recently in 2021, the OPE reinvigorated our peer support program and we've started a program to, um, to highlight our exemplars in professionalism. So what's listed here is my co-director, Jeff Druck, who is a professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine, and Josiah Harris, who's the Associate Director for the office. And she is a um, clinical psychologist and certified mediator and provides services not only to the School of Medicine campus, but also the other four schools and colleges that make up AMC campus. The Office of Professional Excellence, or OPE, um, is a private resource for all matters pertaining to professionalism to any member of the campus, residents, fellows, faculty, and staff. Our primary goal is to help those who have been involved in an incident return to being productive and valued members of the community. It's not intended to be disciplinary or punitive in nature. However, we, I, I will share that there, when I first came on board, there was very much that perspective or perception um, that it was a negative reporting um, office. And so we worked very hard to move away from that perspective as much as able. What's this is here is just simply to show you uh, where we sit in um, the Dean's leadership chart. So this is adapted from our Dean's office. The OPE um, reports directly to our Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, but we partner very closely with the Office of Faculty Affairs. And of course, as within any School of Medicine, we report ultimately to the Dean of the Medical School, who is also the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs, which explains why we also offer services to the other schools and colleges, because he has scope over um, that as well. The OP is supported by leaders on campus, on our on medical campus, um, and we refer to the, uh, this group of individuals as our Professionalism Executive Committee, or PEC. And the members of the PEC include our Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs, Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, our Senior Managing um, Counselor or Lawyer, um, the Director of Human Resources and Risk Management, medical staff president and the CMO for both Children's Hospital and the Adult Hospital. We meet with, um, as a committee, twice a month on the first and third Wednesday of every month to review all reports of behaviors that are submitted to our office, both exemplars of professionalism along with unprofessional behaviors. And I'll review with you our process in just a few slides. The next task that Jeff and I took on after renaming our, our office is, was to ensure that the members of um, PEC as well as the leadership were held to the highest professional standards. So we developed a recusal process and a conflict of interest process, particularly when, in, uh, when individuals who were reporting to our office as unprofessional behaviors, if, if they had a professional relationship with one of the members of PEC, we recognize that it was critically important that the members of PEC disclose the relationship and refrain from any advocacy or decision-making um, in regard to case discussion. They were allowed to remain in the room. We could ask questions, uh, ask questions to provide context. However, they were not, and they are not allowed to, again, um, advocate or participate in decision-making. There are rarely occasions in which there are personal relationships as well. In this particular situation, their family or amorous relationships up to seven years after the dissolution of the relationship. In this situation, the, the members of PEC or OPE leadership are required to disclose and they have to recuse themselves during the conversation, i.e. we either place them into a waiting room on Zoom or previous to COVID, they were asked to um, leave the meeting space. The OP is committed to supporting the School of Medicine's mission, vision, and values in regard to DEI work. 
As such, the leaders of PEC and OPE, we have a biannual DEI affirmation and reaffirmation in which we have a spring and fall diversity workshop. This is led and hosted by um, a collaboration between the University of Colorado Office of Equity and the School of Medicine Office of Diversity and Inclusion. We ask all members of PEC and OPE during this workshop to participate in the Harvard Emphasis Bias Survey and we share the results with one, uh, with one another. The recognition is that as leaders on campus and individuals that are making recommendations about unprofessional behavior, we recognize that we all have biases. And if we are unable to recognize and call out each other's biases in a respectful and collegial fashion, we recognize that it could negatively impact the faculty that we are supporting. So this is um, um, a large commitment um, to really demonstrate to the campus that the leadership is committed to upholding the highest standards of diversity, inclusion, um, and equity work, and excuse me, inclusion work. So the next few slides, I'll share with you the process, um, the process for the OPE. We will receive referrals through a variety of different pipelines. What are listed here are the more common um, spaces or offices in which we will receive a report. When an incident is referred to us, it is submitted through a variety of different modes of communication, either email, online reporting, um, using a Qualtrics software, direct phone calls, or referrals from other offices. Each incident is reviewed by at least two of the directors of the office, either myself and Jeff, Jeff and Josette, or myself and Josette. We will make the determination if there has been unprofessional behavior. If the answer is yes, one of us will be assigned as case manager. If the answer is no, um, but we feel as though the behavior needs to be addressed, we will triage that um, behavior to the appropriate office um, to address the behavior. Once we've identified unprofessional behavior, we've um, identified a case manager, we will then make a determination of the level of the unprofessional behavior. And I'll go through that in the next slide. The case manager will then meet with the reporter and we meet with the reporter for three um, different reasons. Number one, we wanna uh, share with them an overview of the process, the, uh, the process of working through an unprofessional event and the intervention that has been planned. The reason for that is we wanna, uh, it's, our, um, uh, it's an intention to build trust with individuals who are submitting reports. And also we wanna provide some, some strategies um, and share with them strategies that we have place, put into place to help protect against retaliation and retribution. The second reason to meet with the reporter is to ask more detail, um, ask questions um, for potentially more detail so that we better understand what, the, um, what was involved in the incident. And then finally, we also use this as a teaching moment uh, to a certain degree to help not only um, support the reporter to identify if they need resources for support, or to provide them some strategies and a skill set that they can utilize in the future if they experience unprofessional behavior again. We will then meet with the respondent. Um, and when we meet with the respondent, we try to do that in a timely fashion, um, close enough to the, uh, to the incident. And we provide that individual with, um, uh, with a single incident as much as able, so that way we can try to affect behavioral change as much as able. We recognize in the literature um, that the best way in order to, uh, to affect behavioral modification is to provide the individual concrete, direct, kind, but with enough detail of the incident so that they understand what occurred and most importantly, the impact that their behavior had either on a team or an individual. There are situations in which the OPE and the case manager will do an assessment for collateral information, um, and that's um, of, a, of a particular incident, and that's done when it's indicated. Um, if it's a single incident, if we've had to up escalate in our level, or if the individual has been reported to our office greater than a level two. And with this next slide, I'll explain to you what those levels are. So we paralleled the work um, that has been done and published in the literature by the Center for Patient and Professional Advocacy by Vanderbilt University. So many of you will um, may be familiar with this. So this is their Promoting Professionalism Pyramid. And um, what, is, um, what is demonstrated here is the foundation is a triage of three incidents as I just went through. 
If there's unprofessional behavior, we'll identify this as a single incident. This is a, the first time an individual has been reported to our office. We provide the feedback as a single report. We, it's referred to in the literature as a cup of coffee. Here at CU, we refer to it as a peer-to-peer -peer feedback. It's informal conversation. It's intended to provide the individual, again, the perspective of their behavior, and the impact that their behavior has, either on another individual or a team. If the individual is reported to us for a second time, we refer to this as an apparent pattern of behavior. And in this situation, um, we provide the individual with an awareness intervention. We make recommendations for them to voluntarily participate in particular resources or training that they might be able to um, gather a skill set in order to have sustained behavioral modification. The third time the individual has been reported to our office for the same behavior, uh, we identify this as a pattern that persists. At this, um, at this level or in level three, we refer to this as our guided intervention. In this situation, we meet with the respondent. We let them know that we are also meeting with their superior, department chair, section chief, et cetera. And in this situation, we'll also do an assessment. We want to obtain collateral information as well in order to have a full understanding of the impact of the behavior this individual is displayed, displaying has on that environment. Once we've done that assessment, we will write, excuse me, we will draft letters of expectation. Those letters of expectation are drafted by the OPE, but they are signed by department chairs and our division, um, division chiefs. In those letters of expectation, we have guided interventions. It has three components. Number one, it has all the, um, the pattern of the incidents of unprofessional behavior. Number two, it has the impact that those behaviors have had. And number three, it has um, outlined high guardrails, if you will, mandated, mandatory participation in, uh, in training or evaluations. We recognize in the literature displays of unprofessional behavior may oftentimes be, um, be related to drug, alcohol, or undiagnosed mental health, um, mental health um, disorders. So as part of the letter of expectation in the state of Colorado, we mandate our, uh, those individuals who receive a letter of expectation to be evaluated by a Colorado Physicians Health Program, which is a safe haven for physicians to be able to be evaluated for those drug, alcohol, and mental health disorders and have interventions um, that are appropriately outlined for them. It's a safe haven because those records are not reported to our state medical board. So the state of Colorado is um, unique in that aspect. And then finally, as a level four, this individual has been reported for, uh, the fourth time. They've received a letter of expectation we still walk through the same process. We meet with a respondent. We notify their superior. We will do an assessment for collateral information. And if we find it's true that this individual is, has not been able to maintain sustained behavior, there's one or two recommendations that the OPE will make to, um, to their leadership. Number one, if they hold a position of leadership, i.e. title, we ask them that they are removed from that leadership role. Number two, Number two, if we do not hold a leadership title, we will ask, the, um, we will then inform them and, depart, uh, and their departmental leadership that they are no longer considered a valuable faculty member and we will remove them from either the teaching space if they have, um, if they attend um, on medical rounds or surgical rounds for that matter, or if they are teaching within the School of Medicine, we will remove them from, um, from those responsibilities. And we could also make the recommendation that they seek employment elsewhere. We often hear that there is concerns about retaliation um, when individuals are making a report. And we recognize that in academic medicine, there is a hierarchy um, and there is, um, as we talk about the hidden curriculum, there is some, um, very reasonable reasons why people feel as though that there is retaliation if there is reporting. So when our office was first created, the Dean of the Medical School at that time just recognized the importance of a safe space to report. 
Um, be that as we may, unfortunately, we're unable to 100% um, commit to confidentiality. And the reason for that is if we want to provide feedback about behavior, we have to be able to provide enough detail that the individual understands the event and can take action um, to change that behavior. You can imagine if I walked up to Dr. Soto and said, Dr. Soto, you did something really terrible last week. It was really inappropriate. It had a really bad impact. You need to stop. Dr. Soto is going to look at me and ask me to leave her office. It's insufficient information to provide her any um, true um, opportunities to change behavior. And if nothing else, it will cause distrust in our system. That being said, we recognize that retaliation does occur. And there's only three of us that serve the office. So one of the strategies that we utilize in order to protect individuals from retaliation or retribution is that when we meet with the respondent, we inform them that the intention of meeting with them is to change behavior. It's not to get them in trouble. With the intention of change behavior, we then ask them to keep our meeting as private as able. Meaning we ask them not to engage in any conversations in which they try to seek out who reported them or to, um, verbally share with others that they were reported to the office because it can be misinterpreted as retaliatory or retributive in nature. We also inform the respondent that we've told the reporter if they feel as though that there is any behaviors that may be retaliatory, that they are, uh, they are to report it back to the OPE and we will then up escalate to level two. So um, although we cannot um, prevent retaliation or retribution, we have processes in place to protect. There's other ways and strategies um, that we can um, provide some anonymity and privacy in regard to the individual who's made the report. A couple of those strategies are if it's a student and or a resident, we will wait until the end of the rotation or end of graduation before doing an intervention. Um, number two, we can hold, that on, um, hold the report on our database until such time an individual has been reported to our office a second time. We will go back to the first report and ask permission to combine the two events. And then thirdly, if the behavior was observed with, the, uh, with multiple individuals, we're able to message that to the respondent um, in regard to their behavior that was observed by multiple individuals. So in regard to our database migration, <laughs> one of the big reasons that we wanted to change our database is we really wanted to take um, a retrospective review of all the cases that had been submitted to the office before 2018 and to build a database in such a fashion that we would be able to identify categories of behavior and tags of behavior. And everything that you see listed here it's actually taken from the literature. So we've um, built our database based on um, published um, data and published manuscripts. There are seven categories of behavior, unprofessional behavior that we currently have in our database. Personal responsibility, diminished capacity for self-improvement, inability um, to build trusting relationships, inability to work in teams, poor communication and workplace instability. Um, and yes, I realize that there's only six here. What is listed here in this uh, next slide is the seventh category of um, behavior, and that's learner mistreatment. And the reason why we've included learner mistreatment for all the obvious reasons, but also um, because of the double AMC graduation questionnaire is one of the metrics that the OPE uses and utilizes to try to identify culture change. So what we know it's in the literature and what I'll be sharing with you a little bit in just a, in just a bit is that 97% of the community here within the School of Medicine is never reported to our office. They actually achieve either excellence in communication at the top of the bell curve, um, or they're just simply uh, uh, not reported to our office. And so we really want to try to move away, cut off the red tail, so to speak, um, of those 3% of the individuals that keep getting reported to our office. And we want to move towards truly a culture um, that um, demonstrates excellence and professionalism here in the School of Medicine. So with that in mind, um, we also have built into our database exemplars of professionalism. And here's the tags that we utilize. So that way we can identify um, those individuals who are really performing at the top of their scope um, in professionalism. And we can demonstrate um, um, in future state that the programs that we are developing is having an impact um, on our culture. 
So what's listed here um, is by percent the case of submissions that have been reported to the OPE from 2014. And by year, it's percent based on the number of full-time faculty per year. And what you see at the bottom, going across the bottom, total numbers, that's total percent. And it's in keeping with what we know of the literature is um, less than 3% of the faculty across um, academic centers and in healthcare organizations are reported for unprofessional behaviors. So the good news is that the School of Medicine is not an outlier in that area. Um, and what, uh, if, what you, uh, if I can pull your eye all the way to the right, um, under total, this is the total number of cases um, that have been reported to the OPE by levels. So the vast majority of cases that are reported to our office, level one and level two, we really never hear from again. So approximately 80% of um, the individuals that we speak to, um, thankfully, we never hear from again. Unfortunately, there is uh, a number of individuals that keep coming back to our office and we recognize have impact on the culture, which is why we've um, which is why when Jeff and I took over, we really wanted to revamp our process of, of walking through unprofessional events. There's a couple of limitations to this particular data set that I simply want to call out. Um, you'll see at level four, there's only um, there's been uh, only one case um, which met a level four. Um, Couple of things in regard to that. Oftentimes, they are not reported up to our office again because the leadership, their local leadership, either department chair or supervisor, has addressed the issue because they've already heard from us at the level three component and they've decided um, that they would um, address the behaviors on their own. Uh, second reason is that um, with this database migration, um, we did not have a tagline for um, for a second letter of expectation, and we're working on that as we speak. So reported incidents by category. So of the seven categories, the vast majority of cases include um, workplace incivility um, and then on down the list. What you'll see here is at the bottom, the diminished capacity is a really small percentage. And uh, the reason for that is the peer review process in, um, that would identify di diminished capacity in regard to medical competency and medical um, decision making um, are, uh, are the responsibility of um, either risk management or each individual department's quality improvement um, committees. So we don't see a high number of them because these are evaluated in different species. But when we do see them, again, rarely, we, um, we will send, um, send, those, um, send those individuals onto a peer review for appropriate evaluation. And of the most common behaviors, we see that brusque, hostile, or, or argumentative comments are the most common. But what you'll see in, in, um, in these particular co more, most common behaviors of that long list that I showed you earlier in all the categories is that a lot of them have the similarity of communication or poor communication as a particular theme. I'll call out with some granularity that the, in the second, third, and fourth, um, fourth lines, the inappropriate comments, impaired professional relationships, and disrespectful interactions with students, if we did, um, drill down deeper into each of these individual cases, we often identify harassment or discrimination um, as a cause. So with that in mind, we partner very closely with the Office of Equity. Um, and I speak to either Carrie or Will Denise at least twice a week in reviewing cases. We recognize that the OPE and OE work, um, the collaborative work is, to, is incredibly important. Um, in addressing harassment and discrimination within the School of Medicine. Under Will DeWeese's title, you'll see Director of Adaptable Resolution. And this is a new program that's been developed in the last six months and it focuses, focuses on restorative justice as interventions, um, particularly in um, smaller units to address, um, to address unprofessional behaviors and behaviors that relate to DEI work. The OPE utilizes several metrics to help guide performance and to help inform some programmatic development. Um, we've utilized the results of the climate survey from 2016 and 2018. We review on an annual basis the double AMC graduation questionnaire, in particular um, question 20, which um, discusses the unprofessional behaviors. And we also utilize the um, School of 
excuse me, the University of Colorado House Staff Annual Survey that does have some call-outs in regards to unprofessional behavior. We utilize these three along with that data that I just showed. And in thinking about programmatic development, we also wanted to recognize um, and understand who are the faculty that we are serving. So what's listed here is the breakdown of the faculty by rank, gender, and race and ethnicity. And what you can see under gender is um, females um, make the majority of the physicians um, uh, and APPs here within the School of Medicine. But what you'll also see is that there is some, um, uh, uh, there's a, there is the attrition, I guess, of the instructor level of female um, being overly weighted. And then once you get to the full professor, they are underweighted relative to males. And looking at race and ethnicity, uh, in, in aggregate, it, uh, we have about 18% that are underrepresented. And this is critically important as we think about the culture within the School of Medicine, um, because we recognize that fellow students and faculty we're becoming just a more diverse society. And we're becoming a more diverse school of medicine. And that's so important, um, certainly as we think about the quality of care aspects as the patients that we serve in the community, at least here in Aurora, Colorado, um, very high percentage of Black and Hispanic. And we, and we recognize and we know um, based on the literature that those patients actually receive better outcomes when they're taken care of by um, individuals of the same race and ethnicity. So ensuring that we support and develop programs that are unique and specific um, to um, our URM, but also with a focus of inclusion um, and training for our Caucasian um, faculty is critically important to the work that we're doing, not only in the OPE, but across the School of Medicine. And we're very lucky in OPE to be able to partner with um, our Office of, of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Community Enhancement Leadership Council, who developed this framework for how to evaluate culture enhancement with the lens from DEI. And this is a um, this is a slide that was was provided to me um, by Dr. Rita Lee, who's a professor in the Division of GIM, and who's really done a lot of this foundational work for culture enhancement. So the services that we have developed in the last two years, we OPE to really focus on leadership development at the individual level um, in order to hands a, enhance a culture of professionalism and uh, is listed here. We provide professional development um, counseling and recommendations. Again, these are all one-on-one, -on -one. leadership coaching, um, communications training, conflict management, mediation uh, between individuals. We're also simply a safe place um, to come talk about work pressures or professional pr um, or personal pressures. And we've also developed a peer support program that I'm hoping that I can talk to you a little bit um, if, if time remains. Jeff and I also went on a pretty substantial, um, not only listening tour, um, but um, training tour as well. Once we went through our process and honed down on our process and developed these services, uh, we went, uh, we were, at, we were invited to present at Grand Rounds at um, uh, several of our departments. So we, what we have listed here is 18 clinical departments and five foundational science departments. And we've been able to present at 17 of um, the departments. This is over the course of 2019 and 2021. Um, but what this slide does not include is the 70 plus talks that we gave across um, the campus that did not include just um, departmental level. We spoke to a variety of lectures, um, invited lectures, and to um, key stakeholders, um, offices, i.e. ombuds, et cetera, to really um, put our services um, out there and available on campus so people knew what the processes were for the OPE and they would put a face to the service, um, which was critically important to develop trust um, in our, uh, for our office. I'll call out medicine here. It was asterisked. Um, all, all the departments that are listed in italics, we have not presented to run rounds, um, but medicine, we are on the slate for next year. And we also have um, uh, provided a presentation at our division um, section, uh, division chiefs um, uh, meeting so they are aware of our services. 
So now I'm gonna go through a very high level of all the work that the OPE has been involved in um, to help support the, the development of professional identity um, across, the, across the continuum from UME, GME, and, and, a, and faculty professional development. So the School of Medicine um, recently completed a curriculum reform and it utilized medical professionalism as our belief system and it explains all the reasons um, for the mission, vision and values um, and, the print and the guiding principles that inform the School of Medicine truck curriculum. And what's listed here is an overview, um, the 30,000 foot view of our curriculum reform and the OPE has um, been focused on um, our year one excellence in professionalism as touch points, foundational interventions where we can truly infuse professionalism as a guiding principle um, for, the work, uh, for the work of the development of our young physicians and not, as I like to say, um, not as a cuss word. So myself, um, so I, in collaboration with um, Dr. Glover, who is a bioethicist here at the School of Medicine, um, and Dr. Cleveland Higgett, who is a vice chair for DEI in the Department of Family Medicine, we created um, several sessions for um, that focused on professionalism as a guiding principle. So in year one, in a couple of weeks, I'll be presenting professionalism to our um, brand new first year medical students, and we will also be helping to facilitate um, their their creation of their individual years, graduating years, honor code. We also created two sessions for professionalism and communication um, in their first year. So listed here is professionalism across the continuum and a relationship center communication techniques for conflict management. The reason we focused on communication, if you remember back to um, the more common um, behaviors that were reported, they all centered on poor communication. And then in our LICs, year, year one and year four, um, many of the components of metrics for success have, include, have infused in them professionalism and medical professionalism in their compass guide small, group, um, uh, small, small groups. Moving on to graduate medical education, as um, all of you know, the ACGME has six core competencies that help inform our graduate medical education training, and one of which is professionalism as a core competency. And it's this expectation that we are training medical prof professionals um, that, um, that each and every one of them will, will treat each other with respect, compassion, and dignity and they recognize that the patient's needs supersede uh, their own self-interest and that, our, that we train our residents to understand that they are held accountable to the same competency, competency standards um, that we as faculty need to hold uphold of each other. So at the School of Medicine, the OPE has um, partnered with our DIO, Dr. Rumack. Uh, we support um, individual training programs, and here at the School of Medicine, we have 30 residency programs and 79 fellowship programs. We make up, um, um, which help to support and train uh, more than 1,200 trainees. So the OPE has partnered with GME. Um, I help to lead the professionalism and leadership retreat for our annual chief retreat, which is held every September. And as the results come out of the annual ACGME survey, if there are programs that, um, whose results are less are below the national mean for the core competency of professionalism, the GME office will do an introductory email um, to one of the directors at the Office of Professional Excellence in an effort to um, help support the program walk through um, their professionalism core competency. And finally, in regard to faculty, um, our faculty um, are required to reaffirm on an annual basis that we have read through and we commit to uphold a culture of professionalism. And what is listed here are screenshots from our professionalism code of conduct, our faculty promise, and our climate of learning, our teacher learner agreement. Um, and what's a screenshot here is um, what we have to assign and attest to on an annual basis at our faculty evaluation or our prison review. Focuses on leadership development and professionalism development that are offered here on campus include our women's leadership course, Several of the departments, the larger departments have um, leadership development. Um, our leadership um, course director is listed here, Dr. Regensteiner. 
course, the School of Medicine and Physical Professional Excellence, and many more that I have not listed um, in, uh, uh, in total. Um, and I'm very excited um, to share with you all that the School of Medicine, the Dean's Office, we've created a new, a new position, Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Professional Development, that is going to pull together the Office of Faculty Affairs, Office of Professional Excellence, and the Office of Diversity and Equity and Inclusion to really focus on programmatic development um, to enhance our culture here on campus. Um, we are uh, conducting a national uh, national um, search for this. It has not yet been named, but I'm very excited about this prospect. So in another effort to move, um, to cut the tail off the end from professional behaviors and over to more excellence and professionalism, the School of Medicine also has a faculty professionalism award. Um, these individuals are nominated by their peers and are selected by faculty senate. And this is, um, uh, this is awarded on an annual basis. The OPE also supports the Alliance for Professionalism in, Med in Medicine, which is a multidisciplinary um, membership, including students, faculty, and staff across the School of Medicine. The goal is to help improve and promote professionalism on campus and helps to inform the OPE and the work that we do. The first uh, recommendation that they made is we need to recognize exemplars in medicine. So we've asked all departments um, to create departmental professionalism committee. Their singular task is to identify, nominate, um, and award exemplars in professionalism. And what's shown here is a lapel pin that is provided in recognition of um, those individuals who receive, um, who have been nominated for exemplars in professionalism. And just briefly, I just want to go through um, a new program that we've, well, an old program that we've reinvigorated, and this is our peer-to-peer -peer support program. Um, we have a narrow focus for this program. We are not, um, and the reason for that is because the, our adult hospital, use uh, University of Colorado Hospital and Children's um, uh, Hospital of Colorado is doing amazing work at their organization to promote wellness amongst the staff and faculty and trainees. So they have many programs there. This particular program was developed in collaboration with our risk management office and office of university council. Our risk management group who will receive notices of claim or they will receive phone calls from individuals um, who have been involved in a medical error or an adverse event. So our risk, management's were, uh, risk management group was asked to identify faculty who um, had a skill set and empathy and um, um, desire to help support um, this particular program. They identified within um, their, uh, they identified faculty that they had previously worked with. We invited them to undergo training for peer support uh, by a, na a nationally recognized expert in her field, um, Dr. Joe Shapiro. And there were two um, components of training, coping with medical error or notice of claim, and then um, coping with it being named in a claim. The process for, um, for this program is a referral will be placed when a risk manager speaks to a, a provider, and this includes both faculty, residents, and, um, and or fellows. They will identify that the individual that has a need and they will connect with the OPE project manager. Our OPE project manager, Meredith um, Funky, holds the list of all the trained peer support faculty. She will then identify um, the appropriate uh, peer support faculty um, with somebody who is outside of the department or the division and will try to match identifiers as able, year and rank, gender um, and or gender, um, and of course URM status. And then finally, we provide the peer support um, uh, faculty with a script on outreach. They will send outreach either by email or phone. The intention is for a singular meeting is to provide peer support. And they are also provided resources if they identify that the individual um, needs more help than a, than a single peer support meeting. Goodness, um, it's a mouthful. Um, the work that I do in the office um, it, uh, could not happen without really amazing collaborations with um, the members of these uh, programs that are listed here um, and within our community support as well. 
So with that, um, I have many, many people to thank um, that I could not list here. Um, but most importantly, I want to thank you all for listening um, to this whirlwind, um, whirlwind history of the Office of Professional Excellence. So with that, I believe I have uh, left enough time for um, some questions. Thank you, Dr. Lara. I really, really appreciate it. I want to um, not freak you out a little bit, but now in the, did you just notice, um, <laughs> in the gallery view, you will see many people named Abigail Lara. Um, we'll just consider that as cheerleaders to you and to the presentation. Um, apparently, Zoom send individuals to a webinar versus a Zoom meeting, um, and um, we... We made it happen. So we welcome those that joined us a little bit later um, and invite you to ask any questions now. I do have a, a question while others get ready um, to ask their own question, but you know, what does remediation um, or the cup of tea look like for a faculty member who was referred um, to you due to racist or discriminatory or, or microaggressive behaviors? Oh, that's a great question. So, yes. Um, so, as I mentioned, we partner very closely with the Office of Equity. So, when a report is submitted to our office and there is a concern about discrimination um, or inequity or harassment, we asked the individual making the report, did they feel as though they, um, uh, that they felt that they were discriminated against or harassed? If the answer is yes, because we are a um, state funded institution and we are a mandatory reporting office, we then send that report over to the Office of Equity. So we'll have a phone call conversation with either Will and or Carrie. We'll talk to them about the incident. We take the responsibility to share the report first. So that way that individual does not, um, the individual who's making the initial report doesn't have to repeat it multiple times. After we speak with Carrie um, and or one of the investigators in the OPE, if they feel as though they need to do an investigation, they will then conduct an investigation to determine if the incident met the legal standards for harassment discrimination. If the answer is yes, they take that forward. If the answer is no, and that, ha and that happens probably three quarters of the time that I send on a um, report, then I will sit down with the individual respondent and talk to them about the impact that their behavior has. I try to, um, we, we take, if we take that cup of coffee, cup of tea, or peer-to-peer -peer feedback as an opportunity to have that individual, number one, share are their personal or professional stressors that are causing them to act the way that they are, because we recognize we're all human. Sometimes we, sometimes we make mistakes or we have bad days. And we also take it as an opportunity to provide that individual education about the language that they're using or what they have said um, has had a negative impact um, on that individual. So we do take a lot of opportunity to try to educate the individual about the importance of the words that we use in communication. And particularly from the DEI lens, um, all three of us in the OPE have undergone certification training in regard to DEI work. And if I feel as though the individual might not necessarily hear the message that I'm trying to provide, um, we will partner with our Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, um, who currently, uh, there are two individuals in there that I will reach out to, to ask them if they would be willing to meet with this individual for education for educational purposes. I will not share that the individual was reported to the OPE in the best interest of ensuring integrity in our process and in respect of the individual that was reported, but I will encourage that, uh, that individual to meet with them to further, um, um, to further elevate um, their participation in a diverse working environment in the School of Medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see Brent Miller has his hand raised. Hello, Brent. Hi, very nice presentation. I, I have a question for you. So I'm middle management. Um, and so I deal, I'm going to call them brush fires. I deal with the brush fires before they get to people like you. 
and and I guess the question is, um, you know, uh, you know, is there, you know, wh what tax should we take on these sorts of things? And, and you know, and those are those are things that that and typically they're faculty faculty interactions um, that don't go well, um, and they're observed by the students, the residents, the fellows, the nurses, occasionally the patients. And, um, you know, and I don't know that they rise yet to the level of, of getting the process you just started, but how, how would you advise people like me uh, to address those sorts of things? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I will, gosh, there were so many things I could have shared with you and, and I didn't. I'm very lucky to be able to work at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. We are one of um, five schools across the country that I'm aware of that has a formalized office such as mine, so the Office of Professional Excellence. So we're a reporting space um, that, is, that is focused on the work that I just described. So what we share with individuals and what I'd offer for you, Brent, I completely agree with the brush fires. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we actually see quite a bit of brush fires um, on a quite regular basis that are sort of sent to us from other individuals that would be defined as a middle management, if you will. And what I would say is in sitting in the role that I have been for the past three years, I find it so critically important that we have an organized space for reporting and addressing these behaviors um, by individuals who are trained to provide feedback. Feedback is something we all want and we all wanna give, but unless you're really trained to be able to provide that formative feedback, I've seen and heard and experienced feedback go sideways. And so what I would encourage you to consider is, um, and this is what we tell many members within our campus community as well is, do not hesitate to reach out to somebody in office or somebody that you trust that can provide you guidance on how to provide feedback. One of the lines and one of the data that I have, data slides that I showed that I didn't talk about was the, the, the consultations. Those consultations all refer to um, refer to situations um, that you just described, Brent. We will oftentimes offer to individuals, come talk to us about a situation. I'll help script what you need to say to address the, the situation. The decision to move forward with an OPE intervention is always on, um, is always left to the reporter. If the reporter tells me, I don't want you to move forward with the intervention, we won't. The exception is harm to self, harm to others, discrimination and harassment, because again, the OPE is a mandatory reporting office. But what we are seeing more and more is people are reaching out, um, staff, faculty, residents are reaching out to us and those in positions of leadership roles, reaching out to us to help us provide them some recommendations on how to um, give feedback. And we're seeing that more and more, which I think is um, um, a good litmus test that we are um, getting away from that perception that the office is just um, to get people in trouble. And it's really a place to help support and um, develop uh, professional development, leadership and communication. Thank you very much, Dr. Lara. I want to recognize that it's five o'clock. Um, so again, thank you very much for your time. Do you mind if there's 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 a few Abigail Lara's clapping at, um, there, but <laughs> um, um, would it be okay if individuals have any more questions about professionalism or your office if they contact you? Absolutely. Please send out my email, um, my phone number. I would be more than happy to talk in more detail about the work that my office has been doing. Thank you very much for your time and thanks everybody that joined us today. So, and we'll keep up. Oh. Can, I, can I just uh, put a shout out oh, there? An old friend and, uh, Mo, and uh, <laughs> Mo a looks fellow great resident. As Abigail Lara. So many years ago, I won't say how long it's been since we last uh, met, but back in those days, there wasn't much talk about DEI or professional um, uh, excellence. And uh, I just wanted to cheer your work and, and uh, Silk uh, knows that as well. Uh, all the progress made in the last you know, 20 years plus uh, and on that front. Thank you for, uh, for all the work you do. Oh, Mo, gosh. <laughs> 
you just, oh, my cup is totally full now. Thank you so much. Oh, I just well, see the turtle on there too. Oh, I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So hey, you Abby, have how are you? <laughs> it's a family reunion here. It is a family reunion. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. No. Okay. I'm okay, really well, sad that I'm here to come out to see you in person. We would love to next host. time. All right. Next, next time. Next time. Well, thank you, Mo, for um, doing the little shout out. And Roberto Machado also had his shout out. Um, thank you very much all for joining. And we'll see you in August. Thank you. Unless everyone. I see you all sooner. Bye.